Come on, stand with us this morning. We're excited you're here. Can we put our hands together and give him our best praise right up front this morning? He's worthy, amen? Come on, keep those hands going. All praise, you bring revival. We lift our hands, we lift our eyes up. Where your love is found, there will be no fear. When God, your kingdom come, your will be done here. On earth as in heaven, Spirit of God, pour out our hearts so wide open. And Spirit, we need you now. Come have your way in this place, break our walls down. Spirit of God, pour out on earth as in heaven. shame, you bring redemption, you turn our chains into our freedom, where your love is found, there will be no fear, God, your kingdom come, your will be done.
give him some praise today. He's worthy. Amen. There was a moment when the lights went out. Death had claimed its victory. The king of love had given up his life. The darkest day in history. There on a cross they made for sinners. For every curse his blood atoned. breath and it was finished but not the end we could have known for the earth began to shake and the veil was torn but sacrifice was made as the heavens rose Let's see. church.
if you don't have your elements already, go ahead and grab those either from someone in the aisles. There will be uh, baskets out at the entrance of the worship center as well. But before we get into um, this communion here, I want to explain to those who are unaware of what communion is, um, just what it's about before we do that today. There's a time in recorded scripture where Jesus sat the, it's known as the Last Supper. He sat at this table with his disciples for the last time before he would be betrayed and sent to die. And he began to speak plainly. At this point, he had mainly spoken into parables um, when, he, when he taught, right? But this was the time when he became vulnerable with his disciples and he, he spoke to them plainly and said, this, it, it's time. This is the new covenant that's about to take place. And he began to, to tell them what was about to happen. And it was this new covenant that was, it was not new news to their ears what this new covenant was. When Jesus spoke this new covenant, I can only imagine where their minds went because this was the new covenant that it was prophesied even in the Old Testament. Jeremiah 31, um, God pro uh, sends Jeremiah a prophecy and it says, look, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. I will put my teaching within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will one teach his neighbor or his brother saying, know the Lord, for they will all know me from the least to the greatest of them. For I will forgive their iniquity and never again remember their sin. And this is the new covenant that they get to sit in this room and they get to hear that it's about to happen. This long waited time, this new covenant of permanent forgiveness that so long as we seek him, we can find him, right? And so now Jesus surrounded him at the table or them at the table and, and he said, it's time. So this communion today is a reminder of that, of this new covenant, though it happened thousands of years ago, that it's still true for us today. And that's what we take this for. Now, Paul does write in 1 Corinthians 11 that only believers who are in fellowship with the Lord should take communion. And we should also examine ourselves and in this way, take of the bread and drink the cup. So before we continue, I do wanna offer the opportunity for those who would like to pursue Christ, for those who have, maybe you've been to church all your life and you just aren't sure, or maybe this is your first time ever hearing about Jesus and what he is, who he is, um, who he is about. So if you are wanting to pursue Christ, I want to lead you in a prayer. But also for those who are already believers, this is a time to be able to examine our hearts before we take this communion today. So let's pray together. Father, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the wrongs that I have done against you, for the times when I have not looked to you. Father, I ask that you come into my heart, that you make your throne within my heart. And God, even if I don't know all the answers, I know I can look to you and find you, God. And Father, I pray for the hearts that just need to offer, just need to offer something to you, God, whether it be something that we have done wrong or just haven't looked to you, God. We offer that in forgiveness today. And Father, as we partake in these elements that represent your body and represent your blood, God, I pray that we will respond to you in such a way that is pleasing to you, pleasing to your ears and eyes, God. We're thankful for the opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Matthew 26, 26 says, as they were eating, Jesus took the bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. So let's take the bread, break and eat, and remember his body broken for us. Amen. And then verse 27 through 28 says that he took a cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink from it, all of you, for this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let us take the cup and be reminded of the new covenant promised to us today. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the sacrifice. Thank you for the opportunity just to come into your presence, God. I pray that as we continue in this time of worship that we will, we will have the opportunity to offer all that we are, God. Thank you. Let's continue to worship him. You can 
God, thank you once again for the opportunity just to step into your presence this morning. And God, as we transition out of this time of worship through song, that as we continue our worship, may you just consistently be in our hearts, God, and consistently be with us in whatever step we have, God. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. What an awesome morning it has already been. Participating in communion with one another, singing songs of praise and worship. And I look, I know we do that every week, but it doesn't get old. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to have you. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Jared. I'm one of the pastors on staff here, and I wanted to come out and say welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being a part of Connection Point Church this morning. If you are watching online, thank you for tuning in. Uh, scoot in close. And if you are here today and you are new, or maybe you're watching online and you're new, this is the first time you've tuned in live, I want to say a special welcome to you. Thank you for joining us today. If you would like to know a little bit more about Connection Point Church, you can scan the QR code on the screen there, or you can text the word GUEST to 573 573- 340-4037. We'd love to answer any questions that you may have and, and uh, just let you know a little bit about us and what we're about. Here at Connection Point Church, we love our weekend experience and we love getting together on Sunday. But for us, it's more than that. We want to um, help disciple you throughout the week. And so one of the ways in which you can, when you leave this building, stay uh, focused on the Lord is by joining one of our small groups. You can do that by going to yourcpc.church slash groups, or you can go to the groups wall out there in the lobby and get group related information there. Maybe you want to join a life group and you want to develop some relationships, or perhaps you want to learn about a specific topic. You can join a, a topical group that has a start date and an end date. Uh, there are different groups. And so I would encourage you to check those out before you leave this morning. And uh, as we transition from a time of worship and song to a time of worship and giving, there are a few different ways in which you can do that. Scripture says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 that when we are to give, we should do so with the mindset of it being a gift. This is nothing that you should feel forced to do. This is not why we give. When we, when we give, this is worship because without your partnership with us, we simply couldn't do the work of the ministry that we do. And so when you give, do so cheerfully. Scripture says that God loves a cheerful giver. And so whatever God has laid on your heart to give this morning, you can do so in a few different ways. You can text the amount that you would like to give to 84321. You can go online at yourcpc.church slash give. You can visit the drop boxes in the back of the worship center before you leave, or you can mail in your offering to the address on the screen. Let's pray. Lord, we love you today, and we thank you for the opportunity to gather here. And I know that we gather here every week, but Lord, let us never get over the fact that we can gather here, that you have invited us here. We pray that this morning isn't just another morning. We're not showing up because we feel like we need to. Remind us, Lord, that we are here to draw close to you, to learn more about you, Father, to know the call that you have on our life. We love you, Lord. We pray that you would bless the time that we have set aside for you and the offering we have prepared for you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, listen, there's a lot going on at Connection Point Church, and so we have a quick video for you all to watch. And now here's a little bit of what's coming up at CPC. Starting September 9th and 11th, join one of two Financial Peace University classes and learn how you can pay off debt, save more money, and build wealth. Visit the table in the lobby if you have any questions. This month, we have groups for you to grow in your faith and life. From learning about the basics of the Christian faith to taking a deeper dive into your faith and even reconnecting in marriage, we have a group for you. Learn more about these groups and how to get involved at yourcpc.church groups. CPC will be delivering hundreds of food and hygiene bundles to local families, and we need your help. We need 200 drivers to deliver the bundles on Saturday, September 14th. Help us spread the love of Jesus to our community. There is an emergency need for blood donors, so please take the time to donate at the Red Cross Blood Drive on September 26th. One donation can save up to three lives. Hey kids and families, Kids Point is bringing you a night of trunk retreat you are sure to love. It's following Jesus. So come on over to CPC on Saturday, October 26th from 6 to 8 p.m. for a fun family atmosphere featuring lots of candy and goodies. We also need candy for Halloween, so please bring bags of individually wrapped candy and place them at the spot in the lobby. To get more info, register, or check out what else is going on, head on over to yourcpc.church slash events. Now let's get to the message. Good morning, CPC. Well, we had some beautiful worship this morning and then a wonderful time of communion. If you're just glad you came to church today, can we give Jesus 10 seconds of our best praise to him? We love and adore our Savior. 
So grateful to the Lord. Amen. Hey, fist bump two people right now and tell them you are awesome. Glad to worship with you this morning. Maybe the biggest compliment they get all week. Tell them, man, I'm so glad to be here with you. And online campus, we're excited to be with you as well. Hey, online campus, if you would right now, download our message notes off of any of our outlets in-house. Grab yours. We're going to start a new series today. Uh, and I'm going to make one more uh, little promo about Greece. I wouldn't have even done it last week if I had known the uh, tour company was going to send us these really cool brochures this week. I got them in the mail. They're out at the Next Steps counter if you're interested in uh, possibly going in September of 25, 10 days through Greece, the Steps of Paul with Lisa and I. Uh, you can pick this up. It's out there on the Next Steps counter. It gives you all the information about it, and you can pick it up. All I'm going to say about that, I'm ready to get in this message we're going to have a good time. We're in a new series. It's called Riders of the Storm. This is kind of funny. Uh, some people saw the, the promo piece that we're promoting a new series this weekend out on social media this week, and they thought, surely by Riders of the Storm, I was going to talk about the second coming of Jesus, and they were so excited. Well, I'm here to disappoint you, because that's not what this sermon series is about, if that's what you thought it was, and I just love that. Uh, in fact, what we're going to do over the next five weeks, we're going to finish up the book of Acts. It's only taken us like nine months, but it's been an awesome journey. Have you enjoyed the book of Acts? Yes. Hopefully you've learned a lot through this, 30 years of history uh, in nine months. So uh, seeing the church in action, remember our theme this year is putting our faith into action. And so that's why we've been looking at the church. Uh, but over the next five weeks, we're going to see, a, it's going to be very practical. We're going to see uh, some issues that Paul went through, and though ours looks different, same issues we still face today as we're going to see today. And we're going to ask ourselves the question every week, how do we navigate through this storm in order to honor God and bring glory to Jesus and get through it on a healthy note? Because how many know if a storm begins, there's always an ending to the storm? And we know we've got an ending to every storm, but what we want to do over the next few weeks is how do we navigate when we're in the storm? And so that's where we're going to be at. Today, we're in Acts chapter 20 and chapter 21. If you would, let's pray together and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Father, we love you. Thank you, Father, for this morning. What an incredible time of worship. King Jesus, be magnified, be glorified today. Lord, we're available. We want you to speak to us. And God, we pray over these next few moments, you'll take your holy word and you let it come alive to us. Help us to know how to navigate through stormy relationships, as we're going to see today in the scriptures, and help us, Father, come through in a way that brings honor and glory to your name. So give us ears to hear, hearts to receive, minds to comprehend and understand, and faith to put your word into action in our lives, that we may bring glory and honor to the one we love and adore. In Jesus' mighty name, and all God's people said, we love and adore him. Let's give him three more seconds of our best praise this morning, then get ready for the word. Amen. All right. Open your Bibles. Acts 20 and 21. We're here and uh, we're going to jump into this topic today, navigating stormy relationships. You've been around life long enough by now to know that every relationship can get messy from time to time. You can get downright stormy at times in your lives, right? And today we're going to look at three scenarios that I want you to contemplate. And we're going to see how the Apostle Paul addressed these and got through them, because we're going to deal with these from time to time. Such as this scenario. What do you do when you know God has spoken to you and he's directing your life? You're wanting to follow his will. You have a direction. You believe the Lord wants you to go. And as you are pursuing on, the people you love and respect the most can't see it or they don't understand it. They haven't grasped where you're going right now. And so you end up having opposition from the very people you love and respect because of the direction God is leading you. How do you navigate through that relationship when they want you to go a different direction? Here's our second scenario of the day. What do you do when you're wanting to move forward and you're trying to put one foot in front of the other and you're trying to take steps forward into the life God wants you to have and living as God wants you to live and fulfilling his purposes and plans and all of a sudden, every time you walk around one corner and then another, someone's always there to remind you of your past. When your past is always coming back up, being thrown at you, your mistakes, your fears, 
or maybe someone's just taken where you're at today because they knew you back then and they manipulate what you're saying or they cause other people to distrust where you are. How many's ever had that happen? I've had that happen a ton of times in my life. How do you navigate through that? How do you navigate through when you know God's got a direction for you and the people you love the most do not, uh, do not support it and they're in opposition? And then secondly, what do you do when your past keeps being thrown up at you and, and trying to hold you back and bring you into conflict? Here's the third scenario we're gonna attack today. What do you do with critics? How much should you try to appease your critics so they will leave you alone. And listen, if you're out here in this room or watching online or listening to the podcast and you're like, I don't have critics in my life. Well, friend, let me tell you, if you start being a little more open about your faith and you start being unashamed for Jesus, critics will rise up out of the woodworks for you. Paul said it like this to a young preacher named Timothy, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. <laughs> Critics abound. And if you try to do anything, someone's gonna be there to criticize it. How much do you appease a critic? We're gonna look at all of those today because we see them in the passage with the apostle Paul. He faced them all. And he's going, we're gonna learn from him how to navigate through this. We're beginning a new series today called Riders of the Storm. And, uh, and, and as I said, we're going to, Look at how to navigate through. You know what God's desire is for you? God's desire is stated through the prophet Isaiah. God wants you to be like, uh, mount up with wings like an eagle and soar above your storm so you can get through it in a way that brings honor and glory to God. How many wanna navigate safely through and come out on the other side? So that's what we're gonna do. Let's go uh, with me to Acts chapter 20, first of all, and let me remind you of a verse we've used over and over again in this series. It's Apostle Paul, he's on his way to Jerusalem, the year is AD 57, and his eyes are set, his gaze is set, his heart is focused. Here's what he says in Acts chapter 20, verses 22 through 24, Paul says this, Paul says, I am on my way to Jerusalem, I am compelled by the Holy Spirit to go to Jerusalem. Who told Paul to go to Jerusalem? The Holy Spirit did. He says, I'm compelled. The Holy Spirit's made it clear. This is where I'm supposed to go. He goes on to say and says this, and the Spirit has warned me in every city that I've went to that chains and afflictions wait for me in Jerusalem. Question, could God be truly asking Paul to go to a city that he knows chains and afflictions are awaiting him? Yes. And Paul, God is warning Paul. He's letting him not be caught off guard when he gets there. Hey, Paul, I want you to go to Jerusalem, but problems are gonna be there. And then listen to the heart of Paul, and this is the key. Paul says, I do not count my life of any value to myself. My only aim is to finish the race the Lord has given me and the ministry in which the Lord Jesus has called me and to testify to the gospel of God's grace. That is a man of God with his eyes set and his heart focused, and he doesn't want anything to derail him. Now, this is what's interesting. He says this to a group of Ephesian elders from the city of Miletus, and the reason that he went to Miletus, verses 13, 14, 15, tells us is because he did not go to Ephesus because he knows emotionally he would have been derailed from his focus. He knows that if he went to Ephesus where he had just lived for three years and planted a church and loved those people, that if he went there to tell them goodbye, he knew in his heart, I don't know that I would ever make it down to Jerusalem. How many of you have ever had to make a hard decision and know that there's certain people you couldn't get around or it would drag you back down? You wouldn't do what God told you to do. That's where Paul was. So in Miletus, he calls for the elders of Ephesus to come over. He couldn't go be with the whole church. He just got the preachers and he got them together and he said, listen, boys, I'm on my way to Jerusalem. The Lord has told me to go to Jerusalem. But he still had to say goodbye to those folks. And let me show you just how difficult following God's will was for Paul in this moment. Look on the screen at verses 36. Through 38, this is him telling the Ephesian elders goodbye. After he said this, he knelt down and prayed with all of them. There were, say it with me, many 
tears shed by everyone. They embraced Paul and kissed him. Why? What's the next word? They're grieving. They're grieving most over this statement that he would never, they would never see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. Can you imagine the weight on Paul's heart as he stood on the bow of the boat and was leaving Miletus to go down to Tyre and he's waving goodbye to all the Ephesian elders and they're crying on the beach and they're weeping and sobbing. His heart was broken. And it didn't get easier when he got to Tyre. In fact, look with me at chapter 21, verse four. What happens when he gets to the next city? He says, we sought out the disciples and we stayed there. How many days? Seven days. Now read this line because this is interesting. Through the spirit, they told Paul what? Not to go to Jerusalem. Now look up here at me because I want to clarify something. When you first read this, it sounds almost like a contradiction. Like Paul says, I'm going to Jerusalem. The Lord wants me to. And now all of a sudden you got these believers saying, through the spirit, don't go to Jerusalem. Now, here's what I want you to understand. The book of Acts is not a doctrinal book. The book of Acts is a 30-year history book. Dr. Luke is writing what he sees and what he hears. He's writing from an observation and he's writing it all down for us. Now there's doctrine in it, but the book is also a history book. What is Dr. Luke doing? He is showing us that in that moment, those believers in Tyre felt the same burden of the Holy Spirit that Paul felt. That in Jerusalem, bad things were gonna come. They were actually confirming the very sense that Paul knew from the Holy Spirit that he was that chains and afflictions were waiting for him. Now, you put yourself in their situation. In fact, when we read the Bible, one thing we're gonna to have to stop doing is we've gotta stop reading the Bible and thinking they are so super spiritual, they heard audible voices from God and we're not. Can I tell everyone something? These people in the scriptures were just as normal human beings as you are. How does the Holy Spirit speak to us today? Very few people can ever say they heard an audible voice from God. We hear God speak to us through his word. God speaks to us sometimes through circumstances and sometimes the Holy Spirit, many times the Holy Spirit speaks to us through this discerning of the spirit within us. Paul said it like this in Rome, our spirit bears witness with his spirit. And so we feel this, this inclination, this churning, this burning, this impression of the Holy Spirit of a direction we wanna go. And we know it's the Lord when it never contradicts the scriptures. Are you with me today? So what were these men and women feeling? They didn't have an audible voice. When, when, when Luke says through the spirit, he is writing observationally. He's seeing a very emotional moment and they're begging him not to go. Why? Because in their spirit, they were being confirmed. They knew, they felt it. By the way, how many of you have ever been around someone and just felt an intense burden that something wasn't right? Or they shouldn't go there. They shouldn't go with that person or they shouldn't do that thing. You ever had that happen? If you loved that person, what was your next action? You begged them not to do it because you love them and you care for them. These early Christians in Tyre felt the same burden in the confirmation of the spirit that bad things were waiting for Paul. They did what loving people do. They begged him not to go. But Paul is focused and he went on. He left Tyre. He goes next to Caesarea. There he goes in the house of Philip, the deacon who turned into an evangelist. You know, the guy who in Acts chapter eight baptizes the Ethiopian eunuch. Now, let me show you from Acts chapter eight to this passage, more than 20 years has passed because when you come to Acts chapter 21, we know that uh, Philip has been in Caesarea for more than 20 years. He has four daughters, most likely all teenagers, and they, the Bible says they all have the gift of prophecy. And while they're there, a prophet from Jerusalem shows up named Agabus. Now, now you go to your message notes and you pick up the reading with me. Look at this. And after he, we had been there several days, uh, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea and he came to us and he took Paul's belt. Watch what he does. He takes Paul's belt he tied his own hands and feet, and here's what he said. The Holy Spirit says in the, this way, the Jews in Jerusalem 
will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him over to the Gentiles. Now look up here. How many know not a person in that house church at that moment shouted, amen, praise Jesus. This is not a hallelujah moment. This is not a Baptocostal experience. This is heaviness of the heart. As this preacher says, the man who owns this belt is getting ready to be bound in Jerusalem by the Jews and handed over to the Romans and be put in prison. Now I want you to look at the next line and see if you catch a key uh, word here that Luke includes and we haven't seen it thus far. You ready? When, next word, we heard this. Both we and the local people pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. So far, Dr. Luke has been with Paul and he was there when he was being cried over by the Ephesian elders and they watched him say goodbye. He was there in Tyre when the Christians all gathered around him and begged him, please don't go, please don't go. And Dr. Luke has stayed neutral and he stayed out of it. But when Agabus come, this was such a heavy moment. There is so much, uh, listen, Dr. Luke is like Papa. How many know who Papa was? Your cartoon, right? You know, he's just 30 miles from here. You better know Popeye in this area, right? Popeye, the great theologian, used to say this, I've stoods all I can stoods and I can't stoods no more. And that's Dr. Luke in this moment. Dr. Luke's like, I've stoods all I can stood and I can't stoods no more. And Dr. Luke says, even I joined in and I begged him, please, Paul, don't go down to Jerusalem. Do you feel the weight yet? of what Paul is feeling, everybody he loves is hanging on him, crying and sobbing and saying, please don't go to Jerusalem, Paul. How many know it'd be so tempting for Paul to turn around and say, okay, I'm listening, y'all. I'll stay here with you. Let me show you a man of God who's convinced that he knows the will of God for his life. Look at the rest of the passage here. Then Paul replied, what are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. Is Paul feeling the pressure here? You better believe it. You're breaking my heart. For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Look at me, family and friends. Folks, what do you do with someone who is so convinced the Lord has shown them the way even when we struggle with it. What do, you, what do you have to do? You have to bring yourself to this moment. Look at what Dr. Luke says. So he would not, since he would not be persuaded, we said no more except, everyone read it with me, the Lord's will be done. Look up here. How many of you know sometimes following God's will doesn't make sense to you? And in that moment, here's Paul. Paul's had everybody in the world tell him not to go, not to go, not to go, not to go, not to go. But Paul knew he had to go because the Spirit told him. Point number one, write this down. Here's what you and I need to understand when we want to follow the Lord's will and not everyone can see it or feel it. Here's what you got to remember. Number one, write it down. You got to prioritize God's will over the will of others. And listen to me, following God's will is not going to be easy every time. Sometimes it's so easy to do what God wants you to do, and other times it is so absolutely difficult. And you've got to answer this question inside of you. How are you going to stay faithful and true to the plans and the purposes of God when those plans and those purposes invite opposition, doubt, and criticism from the people you love? And the only way you're going to be able to answer that question, listen to me, is you've got to answer another question first. Before you can answer that question, you've got to answer this other question. And the other question is, is what is driving your life? What's driving you? Are you looking for success? Are you, are you living for the best life now? Are you living for you? Are you living for your dreams and aspirations? What is driving you? Or are you living for God, willing to do whatever he says and accept whatever comes your path as long as you know you're in his will? This is where Paul's at. If you ask Paul, Paul, what's driving you? Go all the way back to the verse we've used several weeks in a row, Acts chapter 20, verse 22 through 24, I've already quoted it. That's what drove him. What, what did he say? 
I'm compelled to go to Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit's already warned me. Chains and afflictions await for me. But my life is of no value to myself. My only gain is to finish the course the Lord Je- and the ministry that the Lord Jesus has given me and to testify to the gospel of God's grace. That was his aim. That was his goal. So when he found himself in this awkward position, watch this, the drive of his soul would not let him get distracted. He didn't get derailed by people's emotions. So what's driving you? What is God saying to you? What is the plan God has for you? Jesus said this to us in Matthew chapter six, that he wants us to live our lives for a higher purpose than our best life now. Look at how Jesus said it. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then everyone say this line together. And all these other things will be provided for you. Now, here's what I need you to do. I need you to not read that like someone in the prosperity gospel wants you to read that if you put God first, then all these other things as houses and land and money and precious treasures. That's not what this means. Because for the apostle Paul, what Paul needed wasn't any of those things. What Paul needed was God to be with him in the midst of the storms, get him through a shipwreck and get him to Rome where he could preach the gospel to Caesar because that was God's will for him. You don't know what that last line means for you. The goal is I've got to keep my eyes on the kingdom and make Jesus first. And whatever I need on this journey, God will make sure comes to pass. Amen? Here's what Jesus, by the way, by the way, by the way, let me prove this to you. Why did Jesus, the full, who was fully God, I preached about this last week, and he's also fully man, why did God take on human flesh? And I know it was to come be our sacrifice for our sins so he could die and rise again, but did he have to wait 33 years to do that? Have you ever thought about it? Why did he wait till he was 33 years old to go to the cross? Couldn't he have done it at 23? Could he not done it at 13? Could he not done it at three weeks old? Three days old, three hours old? If all God needed to do was take on flesh, couldn't he have been sacrificed as a baby and then resurrected right then? Why did he live to be 33? I wanna tell you one uh, hypothesis I have, and I believe it's backed by Hebrews chapter four, verse 15 and 16, which says this, we today, ladies and gentlemen, have a high priest who can sympathize with all of our weaknesses. For he was tempted in all points just as we are tempted, yet he never sinned. And so today we can come to his throne of grace and we can find help in time of need. Jesus lived just long enough to go through whatever he needed to so he could relate to every one of us through every trial and temptation and season of life. Jesus knew what it was to know love and to know rejection, to have love and to have loss. He knew it was to be accepted and rejected. He even knew what it was like to be stabbed in the back and sold for 30 pieces of silver. Do y'all understand what I'm saying? You have a high priest in Jesus. So no matter what you're going through, you can be like Paul and set your eyes on him. Keep your eyes on him, no matter what anyone else says. And you can always know he understands you. That's why I believe he said these words. And John, look on the screen with me. All right. Next verse, please. John 6, 38, for I have come down from heaven, read it, go, not to do my own will, but the will of him who, what drives you? Do you want to do the will of God? Listen to me, folks. Following the Lord will not always be easy and the people you love the most will sometimes be your biggest critics and not understand. What do you do in that moment? You keep your faith on God. He knows where you are and he knows how to get you through that moment. He hasn't forgot you. He didn't make a mistake. You're right where he wants you to be. Amen? Number two, then you also have to prepare yourself because people have long memories. People have long memories. So here's what happens to Brother Paul. Paul eventually lands in Jerusalem and he goes over there to uh, uh, the apostles. James, the half-brother of Jesus, is leading the church in Jerusalem. 
Now remember, Jerusalem's where the persecution began on Christians. Remember, they are terribly persecuted in Jerusalem at this point. The church is struggling very badly. And it's the Feast of Pentecost. What does that mean? It means Jews from every country, anywhere around, have all traveled because Pentecost is one of the three feasts that Jewish males were required to come back to Jerusalem. The city is full of Jews. Some of them have never heard about Jesus. Some of them don't know who Paul is. There's Jews galore. And so here's what Paul does. Paul goes to uh, James, who's in charge of the church in Jerusalem, and he starts telling him all about his missionary journeys. And they are having a wonderful time. Look at the verse, verse 20. And when they heard it, they glorified God. And they said, you see, brothers, how many thousands of Jews there are who have believed. Everybody shout amen. amen. And they are all zealous for the law. Wait a minute. That don't sound quite right, does it? We're not under the law of Moses anymore. We're now under grace. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever shared your excitement with someone? This is what God's doing in my life. Here's the breakthrough I've had. Here's where I'm going. Here's what I believe God wants me to do. I'm so excited. Are you, will you be excited with me? I'm so excited. Can I just tell you? And the whole time you're talking, they just smile at you. And they're going, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you get to the end of your story. Isn't this great? Yeah. And then they look right at you and they go, but Houston, we've got a problem. What happens to your joy in that moment? It just evaporates and goes right out of the room, doesn't it? This is what James is going to do to Brother Paul. Paul is sitting there saying, look at all these people who've been saved. Look at all these churches I've started. Look at how God is doing miracles. And then look at Brother James. He says, but, I mean, hate a but in a conversation. But they have been informed about you that you're teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to abandon Moses and tell them not to circumcise their children or to live according to our customs. And I want to look at this passage and I want to go, James, bro, you're hearing how God is saving souls and changing lives. And now you're worrying about Jewish tradition more than the doctrine of grace. But we're going to have to give James a little bit of credit. He's the one who's having to live in Jerusalem. He's the one who's having to deal with thousands upon thousands of Jews who've just come into town for the Feast of Pentecost. And what he's hearing out in the community is this uproar. Everybody's getting upset because they know Paul has come into town. And, and the, I, whether it's true or not, here's what they know. They know in every city, and you read this in the book of Acts, every city Paul went to preach, there was a group of Jews who would always follow in behind him. And as he's preaching and people are coming to faith in Christ, they would come in behind him and start getting all the Jews stirred up in the city and saying, he's telling you, you don't have to deal by, live by Moses no more. You don't have to circumcise your kids no more. He don't even want you to be a Jew anymore. And they'd get all the Jewish people in an uproar and city after city after city, they would take Paul and stone him and throw him out of the city. And now James is here dealing that in Jerusalem. Now, you got to give him some credit because here's what I believe is happening. I believe James is actually trying to follow the teachings of his brother Jesus when Jesus said you got to be as wise as a serpent and harmful as a dove. I believe what he's wanting to do is not put a stumbling block in front of the Jews because if they put a stumbling block there, ain't no one going to listen to them when they try to tell them about Jesus. He's trying to find common ground and he's aware just Paul's presence there, everybody's already complaining. What are they doing? They're bringing up the past of Paul from city to city to city. You know what Paul's doing? He's having to navigate through this moment, sitting there with the elders of the church, and he's having to navigate, man, it doesn't matter how many churches I plant, how many people I preach to, how many people get saved. I got to keep dealing with the same old arguing, fussing Jewish people everywhere I go. How do you navigate through that? Because it's going to happen to you too. Because we all got past. We all, we all know people who knew us back when. And sometimes they'll even take what you're saying today and manipulate it and try to make it be like somebody who said it a long time ago and that person's dead and gone in Christ and you're a new creation in Jesus. Things have been made new. 
but they're going to bring back the past. How do you navigate through that? Look on the screen at Philippians chapter 3. Here's what Paul lived by. Paul taught this to the church in Philippi, and he said, one thing I do, ready, read it, forgetting what is behind, I'm reaching forward to what is ahead. So what are you going to do when you're navigating relationships and everyone's bringing back who you used to be, how you used to do things, what you used to say, or they're misconstruing what you're saying today? What are you going to do when you keep having this conflict? Remember, they have a long memory. But as a Christian, if you want to obey the Lord and follow the Lord, you've got to learn this technique. You've got to have a short memory and keep a long gaze on Jesus. You've got to forget that which happened yesterday. You've got to keep forgetting what people said because if you don't, you won't get along with anybody. Because the more you live for Jesus, and this is coming to the third point, here's what you're going to find. You always got critics. And if you dwell on what they said and what they did, you will never move forward. Here's what I need you to know. You've got to keep a short memory and you've got to keep your eyes on where you're going and on the calling that God has put over your life and you've got to keep moving forward because number three, write it down, pleasing your critics never works. Pleasing your critics never works. James is going to actually ask Paul to, uh, in, in, in one way, appease the Jewish people. Got to satisfy the critics a little bit because he's worried that Paul's going to keep them from being able to get the gospel to all these Jewish people at Pentecost. Look with me at verse 22. Look at what James asked Paul to do. He says, so what is to be done? They will certainly hear that you've come. Therefore, do what we tell you. We have four men who have made a vow. Take these men, purify yourself with them, pay for them to get their heads shaved. Then everyone will know that what they heard about you amounts to nothing, but that you yourself are careful about observing the law. Now, is Paul under the law? No. But what James is worried about is don't let our freedom in Christ become a stumbling block to someone who doesn't yet understand freedom in Christ. Let's find common ground. And so he's asking him actually to observe some of the law at Pentecost in order to not bring up a wall that people won't listen to them. And in fact, listen to me, Paul actually preached about this to, to the church in Corinth. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul said this. He said, to the Jews, I will become like a Jew. Why? What's Paul's go? Read the next three words, everyone online campus, come on. To win Jews, to those under the law, I'll become like one under the law. Why? Though I'm myself not under the law, why would he do this? To win those under the law. To those without the law, that's Gentiles. I'll live like one without the law. Why? Though I'm not without God's law, I'm under the law of Christ. But here's my goal. Here's my aim. Here's what's driving me. What is it? To win those without the law. To the weak, I became weak in order to win the weak. I've become all things to all people so that I might by every possible means save some. Now I do all this. Paul says, I do all this because of the gospel so I can share in its blessings. Paul's like, I'm not, I'm not, a Jew. I'm not gonna live under the law anymore, but if I have to do this, if I have to pay for these four men to have their heads shaved so that the people won't reject me and I can get the gospel to them, I'll do whatever it takes. How many of you have learned by now, you can't share the gospel with two people the same way? You've got to get common ground and you'll share the gospel with one person in one way and if you're sharing the gospel with someone else, it may be a totally different route, a totally different method, but the gospel is still the same. And when it comes to this, listen, you're always going to have critics. And here's the deal, here's the deal, here's the deal. The ones who want to know truth you stand up and in love, you stand for what you believe in and you share the truth of the gospel with them and maybe, maybe, maybe they'll come to faith in Christ. They'll understand. Whenever you've got critics, some of them, if, you, if they'll listen to you, let them listen to you. But listen now, don't you dare bend your back over for a critic who's only there to criticize and they don't want the truth after all. 
And there's some people out there that all they want to do is criticize and tear you down and you're not to, what are you to do with those folks? You're to not let them derail you and you're not responsible for bending over backwards to try to make everyone accept you. You need to keep your eyes on Jesus. Stand firm on truth. And the ones who receive you are receiving the ones who don't, don't answer to you anyway. How do we answer? How do we respond to critics? Peter tells us exactly how. Look up here for a moment on the screen. Peter said this, this is how we should answer critics. But even if you should suffer for righteousness, is there sometimes we're gonna suffer for doing the right thing? Could that ever be God's will? Absolutely. But even if you should suffer for righteousness, you are, say the word, come on church. You wanna go to lunch, say it loud. I chose it. Yeah, yeah. Why do y'all get so loud when I do that? Anyway, you are blessed. But what do you do with a critic? Or what should you not do with a critic? Here's what he says you shouldn't do. Do not fear them. Do not be intimidated by them. And how do you keep yourself from being afraid or intimidated by a critic? Look at the next line. He says, set in your heart, Regard Christ the Lord as holy and you be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason of the hope that you have. In other words, when you got your critics, don't let them scare you. Don't be intimidated by them. You don't have to appease them. You need to stand on the conviction that God has put on your life, the purpose and the plans that God has for your life. You stand there on Christ. Put your heart on Christ, not on their criticism. And look at the next part of the verse. And then you respond to them with, say it with me, gentleness and reverence. keeping a clear conscience so that when you are accused, those who disparage your good conduct in Christ will be put to shame. It is better to suffer for doing good if it should be God's will than for doing evil. How many would say amen to that? Amen. Now, why is this so important? I am so tired of seeing Christians lose their testimony on social media trying to argue with people over your views and your beliefs and your political stances. Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. When you just get into arguments and you're letting yourself get enraged and you're lashing back and forth, you're never going to win the argument. You know why? You're playing on the devil's playground. The devil is the accuser of the brethren. He has a doctorate degree in arguing. You're not gonna out-argue the devil. Stop it. How should we answer our critics? Stand on the conviction of God's word and the plans and the purposes he has for our life. We don't get derailed. We don't shift to the right. We don't shift to the left. And we respond with gentleness and reverence. Our hearts are set on Christ, not on the criticism. And you remember this. It's your big takeaway for the day that if you follow after the Lord and you keep your heart right, you don't get derailed by the emotions of people, even the ones you love. You don't get derailed because we keep bringing up the past, have a short memory, don't let it linger, don't let it long, you know, hang on your brain. And you don't let the critics change who you are. You don't change for a critic. Listen, I get criticized all the time especially on how we lead this church, you know, and, and our emphasis on reaching lost people and so on. And don't worry about critics. You're always going to have critics. I am compelled to win as many people for Jesus as possible in my lifetime. That is my desire. I want to lead a people who reach people for Jesus. This is what Paul preached in 1 Corinthians 9. Do all things to all people that by all means we may save some. How many want to see more people in heaven? Because they're the only ones you're going to take with you to heaven. You're not taking anything other than people you win to Christ to heaven with you. So you don't appease your critics. You stand on the conviction of the Lord. And when you respond, you do so gently and reverently. And here's the big takeaway. Jesus will give peace to your soul and wisdom to your steps. 
In John 16, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he tells them what they're going to suffer after he's gone. Well, they didn't like hearing that he's leaving to begin with, but then when he said they're going to kick you out of synagogues, and they're going to bind you, and they're going to arrest you, you know, none of those disciples like that sermon, right? They're all like, I don't like this one. But then Jesus said these words, they're on your message notes. I want us all to read them out loud together. Ready, go. I have told you these things so that in me you may have what? Peace. You will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. I have conquered the world. Look up here at me. Folks, your help is out of this world. Amen? There's going to be times following God, you're going to be opposed by the very ones you love, and it's going to strain that relationship. There's going to be times that people's always going to criticize you and bring up your past and believe you should do things in a different way. I want you to remember to in those moments to look up, as the psalmist David said, I look up into the hills for where my help comes from. My help comes from the Lord. And you keep your eyes on Him and you keep going straight ahead. Amen? Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your Holy Spirit's presence. Thank you for your people and their love for you. God, we pray we need this wisdom. We need this wisdom to navigate stormy relationships. We need to know how, Father God, to uh, stay focused when our emotions are drawing us to the right or to the left. We need to know how to have short memories and not allow uh, critics to get in our head and to dissuade us or to change us. Let's stay faithful and true to you and follow the path you have for us, oh God. And help every one of us have a clear moment with you that we know now what drives our life and may it be for your glory and your honor in Jesus' name. If there's anyone here today, Lord, that hasn't yet come to you in Christ or they're listening to this sermon or watching it online, would you, Lord, give them an opportunity right now to be saved, to know Jesus? If you're here or you're listening, I would love to lead you in a prayer. I can't do it for you, but I'll lead you. If you'd like to know Jesus, would you pray this prayer with me? Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. That you died and you rose again. And you did that for me. Jesus, today I surrender my life to you. I ask you to forgive my sin and to save me, Lord Jesus. Here and now I pray in your name. And all God's people said, you love the Lord. Let's give Jesus a praise for the day. Amen. It's been a good day.